We looked at the motivation for using hyperelastic materials and how they differ from metals. Now, we'll see how one can capitalize on their key characteristics and develop solution methods for capturing their response. To recap two of the key characteristics, they undergo large elastic deformations with very little to no permanent deformation. Also, all the work done in deforming them is stored as internal energy and is fully recovered upon unloading. This makes the deformation of hyperelastic materials a thermodynamically reversible process. So, their behavior follows the second law of thermodynamics. Now, let's shift our focus on how to represent this behavior in the form of a mathematical equation. As noted earlier, the total work done in deforming this material is stored as internal energy and all of it is recovered upon unloading. So, the area under the stress strain curve, which is nothing but the strain energy stored in the material when it is subjected to a certain strain, remains constant as long as the strain in the material is held constant. Due to this reason, the strain energy function is a perfect choice to be a hyperelastic material model. This energy function is usually defined as a function of strain tensor in the material. And the stress developed in the body at any given strain is calculated from this strain energy function. The strain energy function is often expressed as an additive split of the deviatoric and the volumetric strain energies. It's important to note that the stress developed in the body depends on the type of strain that is present in it. For instance, the stress developed in the part at a tensile strain of 20% is different from the stress developed in the same body at a shear strain of 20%. So, it's important to note the mode of deformation that the body is experiencing. In general, there are three different modes of deformation that can characterize the deviatoric behavior of hyperelastic materials, namely uniaxial tension, uniaxial compression, and shear deformation. As you can see from this chart, the value of stress developed in the part at the same amount of strain differs depending on the type of deformation. So, how do we calculate the stress from the energy function and how do we differentiate between different types of strain? To understand this, we must know what the strain tensor looks like for each of these deformation cases. This can be done in two ways. The first method uses principal stretches. Let's start with this cube with the sides of size L is being stretched in one direction. When it is stretched to a size LY, the cube will shrink in the other two directions to conserve the volume of the component due to incompressibility. The ratios of the final length of the cube to its initial lengths are called as the principal stretches. Physically, they tell us to what extent and in what direction did the material change its dimensions during deformation. For instance, at zero deformation state, both the initial and final lengths of the cube are the same. So, the stretch ratios are equal to one. If the part is elongated in one direction, its final length is going to be more than the initial length. So, a stretch ratio that is more than one tells you that it is tension. Similarly, when a part is compressed in one direction, its final length is going to be smaller than its initial length. And hence, the stretch ratio is less than one. And since these stretches are defined in the principal directions, there are no shear deformations in this direction. 
if we measure the changes in the dimensions in the three directions as delta x, delta y and delta z, then we can write them in this form. And simplifying it shows us that stretch is nothing but 1 plus engineering strain. This way, one can relate any type of mode of deformation in the form of principal stretches and use them as a way of representing the strain tensor. Principal stretches are not the only way of representing the strain tensor for all the modes of deformation. Another very popular way of doing this is by using the strain invariance. The strain invariance, as their name suggests, do not vary as the reference coordinate system changes. So, whether a body is undergoing tensile or shear or combined loading, its state of strain can be described using strain invariance. Using one of the two methods discussed above, one can distinguish between different modes of deformation. Due to this reason, they are commonly used in defining hyperelastic material models. Let's look at some of these commonly used models to show you how the hyperelastic models are formulated. This is Neohukian model, the simplest form of hyperelastic material model. This function uses a linear relation between the strain energy potential and the first strain invariant. Note that although the equation is linear, invariant itself is a nonlinear function of strain. So, this is still a nonlinear model. It has only two material constants the initial shear modulus, mu, so it has the units of stress, and the incompressibility constant, which is nothing but 2 by initial bulk modulus. Note that when two different materials are both modeled using neo hookian model, the values of mu and d for both the cases will be different. And this is how we can differentiate between different materials. Now, let's take a look at another form of equation, which is slightly more complicated. The mooney rivlin model is another commonly used form of hyperelastic models. As you can see, it involves more invariants and more material constants. Due to its mathematical nature, it's capable of modeling material behavior that's slightly more nonlinear. Once again, the material constants are related to the initial shear modulus of the material by this equation. And yet again, the incompressibility parameter is related to the initial bulk modulus as 2 by d. The mooney rivlin model that we see over here is just one form of it. In fact, you can add more terms to it to have 5 terms and even a 9 term mooney rivlin model. They come in handy when the material is highly nonlinear and may require more polynomial terms to capture the behavior. The Ogden model is another commonly used form and this one is defined using principal stretches. It can be formulated by one or more terms. Usually the nonlinearity of the model increases as we use more terms. The deviatory component of the model has two material constants per term and the volumetric term uses one constant per term. The initial shear modulus of the material is nothing but the sum of the material constants mu from each term and alpha is just a dimensionless nonlinearity term. D, once again, is nothing but 2 by initial bulk modulus. Earlier, I had mentioned that we'll focus on fully or nearly incompressible hyperelastic materials in this section. But let's look at a hyperelastic model that is used specifically for modeling compressible foam materials just to get an idea of the form. This is the Ogden foam model, which is used to model compressible foam materials. 
Its formulation looks very similar to the Ogden model, but you can notice that both the deviatoric and the volumetric terms are tightly coupled. This makes the model suitable for capturing the deformation when the volumetric deformation is not negligible compared to the deviatoric deformation. This is just one example of such a model with tight coupling between the deviatoric and volumetric terms. In fact, there are several other forms that are available to model such materials depending on how nonlinear they are or even whether they are incompressible such as rubbers or compressible such as foams. In most of the forms that we have seen, we notice that some of the models such as Ogden or Mooney Rivlin can have multiple terms in it. But how do we decide when and how many terms are we supposed to use in modeling a material? To answer this, let's look at what these terms actually do. Let's take this response as example. Say the first term has a convex upward response where the material starts with a stiff response and reduces at higher strengths. And the second term has a concave upward response where the material stiffness increases with the strain. So the combination of these two terms will look like this. As one model is more dominating at the start, we can see that the material starts off with a stiffer response, then the stiffness reduces for a bit, followed by an increase again in the stiffness. Most of the elastomers that have such behavior have very complex microstructure with multiple polymer chains acting as load-bearing components. And each term in the model represents one such chain structure. So in most cases, when you see a response like this, it indicates that we'll need to pick a multiple term model to represent its behavior. Before we conclude this lesson, let's have a short discussion on the incompressibility term. In case of incompressible forms, a proper usage of the incompressibility term is very important. This term is related to the initial bulk modulus of the material. And based on this definition, as the value of D decreases, the material tends to be more incompressible. This term is usually positive and does not have a range, but a value of zero indicates that the material is fully incompressible. In some cases, if we need to introduce a small amount of compressibility to make it nearly incompressible, we need to pick a very small value of D. One recommendation is to set the initial bulk modulus to a few orders of magnitude, about 100 to 1000 times higher than the initial shear modulus and calculate the value of D accordingly.